I want to introduce Jamie Martin to you. And Jamie is, if you don't know her already, she's the editor in chief of Experience Life Magazine, which is an award-winning health and fitness magazine published by Lifetime, where Jamie's also the vice president, vice president of content strategy. And um, full disclosure, if you don't know me, I used to work on staff at Experience Life. That's how I know Jamie. And um, I'm still a contributing editor to the magazine. So I get to have my fingers in the magazine a little bit. So I think it's the best health and wellness magazine on the market. Jamie's career began as an editorial intern at the magazine. And she has just moved through the ranks um, after graduating from the University of Minnesota with a degree in journalism. So you started out as an intern, right, Jamie? And then you moved as the director of, of you did digital and then director of content and executive editor, now editor in chief. And then moving over onto the corporate side to, to oversee overall content strategy and really bring the brands of the magazine and, and Lifetime into closer alignment from a content perspective. Under Jamie's leadership, the, publish, the publication has won numerous regional and national awards for print and digital, including four top folio awards, um, which is a big deal. Just FYI, in the magazine space, that's a really cool, a cool acknowledgement of, of the exceptionalism of experience life. She's a lifelong healthy living enthusiast. Her interests include running, strength training, and yoga. Um, she's also an advocate for Minnesota newborn screening legislation to include a rare genetic disorder such as crab disease. And she might have a chance to talk about that a little bit later. And she lives here in the Twin Cities, which is where I am, where she's got a husband and two daughters, and they enjoy biking, gardening, exploring, and spending time on Minnesota's amazing lakes. So thanks for coming, Jamie. It's really nice to have you here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, Jill. And I say the lakes are a little frozen right now. So I do walk on the frozen lake near my house right now, but that's- Yeah, yeah. You're not splashing around. Out and about. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> But thanks for having me. I'm really excited to, to be here and to see some familiar faces, both from Lifetime, the Lifetime crew and, and meet some new people. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a great, it's a great group. So I hope you can come back. Um, I always kick off every healthy exchange conversation with my guests with a question of what does health and well-being mean to you? Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because I'm in this space every day. It feels like it's just kind of like it's what I do every day, right? Like that's what it is. But when I really sat down and thought about this, it was, you know, it really, to me, it's really a state of equilibrium and contentment in my body and my mind. You know, it's being able to do and feeling empowered to do the activities that I love and, and do them well and functionally. And it's, you know, being able to connect with and engage with the people I interact with every day, whether they're the people closest to me or strangers. And it's really doing that authentic, authentically and meaningfully. And, you know, health and well-being, it's what allows me to show up in this world more fully and joyfully. And it's just a core value, which I know we'll get into. Thanks. Yeah, that's well, that I mean, and that really kind of leads into our topic of purpose, because purpose is a lot about our values. And I want to start by defining our term of purpose. I found a really great definition at the University of Minnesota, Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. So I would like to read that, but then I'd like to get your take as well. Um, and what their website says is your life purpose consists of the central motivating aims of your life, the reasons you get up in the morning. Purpose can guide life decisions, influence behavior, shape goals, offer a sense of direction and create meaning. For some people, purpose is connected to vocation, meaningful, satisfying work. For others, their purpose lies in their responsibilities to their family or friends. Others seek meaning through spirituality or religious beliefs. And some people may find their purpose clearly expressed in all these areas of their life. Mm. What would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that definition is is right on. I think also for me, you know, purpose is really deeply tied to the values that we hold, you know, to the intrinsic motivations that inspire and motivate our daily actions. Um, and that also add value, not just in my life, but they contribute to the greater good, right? And so, you know, I, I love how you and I have talked about her psychologist, Emily Esfahani Smith, you know, she defines purpose in a really interesting way. She ties it closely to meaning and then she contrasts it with happiness. So she stated um, in an article for Experience Life at one point that, you know, happiness is a state of comfort and ease. Meaning is when people feel like they are part of something bigger than themselves. They feel driven by a sense of purpose that what they do matters and they believe their lives make sense. 
you know, and for her and her work, I love, if you have not heard of Emily S. Fahani Smith, I highly recommend like digging into her work and what she does, but purpose is one of the four pillars of meaning in her that she's identified in her research. And she explains that it's all about contributing beyond yourself and being part of something bigger um, in big and small ways. And so I think that's what's, I love that way of thinking about purpose. It's like, it doesn't have to be that I'm out there creating crazy change every day, but it's the small ways that we show up and give back. Um, that tie back to what is truly meaningful for for each of us. Yeah, I love her work too. I mean, we talked a lot about you know how health and well being meet what that means to you and how that is a sense of purpose. But I'm wondering, you know, as you've moved, you know, as you've moved up mm. in your career, but also as you know in your family and in your life, like what what are some of the things that give you a sense of purpose that get you out of bed in the morning? Mm. Yeah. Well, my family, first and foremost, my connections with my family, my core family right now, it's my husband, my girls. I have two daughters who are 12 and nine and even our dog, you know, she gets me up because she wants to go for that walk. First thing, she's a high energy pup who, you know, I have those days. I'm like, Oh, I know Jill, you're going through that with a puppy stage right now. Um, but you know, my family, like they hold my heart, you know, and I want to show up as the best me for them. So other things that get me up, you know, that means, you know, I have to take time for myself so I can show up. And that means prioritizing my health and well-being. It's like I said already, it's one of my core values. So it's always about like taking care of me in small ways every day. Sometimes that's a workout. Sometimes that's reading a book. Sometimes that's just letting myself sleep in a little longer because that's what my body is calling for that day. And it's just so I can show up more fully, um, not just for my family, but also at work, I'm more focused and, um, I want to find joy in what I do. And so that's, you know, part of, you know, what gets me up, like what's joyful. And that's going to get me like seeing my kids first thing in the morning. I mean, I try to make a point of saying them like, I'm so happy to see you today because I truly am like, they bring so much light and love into my life. Um, and I would say, you know, you know, how do I t- like, you know, I've been a helper my whole life. Like that's kind of part of my personality. If you've done the Enneagram and understand the Enneagram, I'm a two, which ends to be a a helper and often a people pleaser as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I, but I've always wanted to serve people, you know, and so to make things better, to make things easier for people. And I think the work at experience life, it's, it's, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to be a nurse. I wanted to help people. And then I realized I can't really handle blood very well. And, you know, other things like that. So, okay, how do I help? I wanted to be a, uh, uh, what was I say? A flight attending. So I'm like, I can help people in those kind of spaces. I've worked in the service industry, but what's interesting about the work at experience life is it really does sync pretty perfectly with the idea of helping, um, and serving people because it's all about helping and empowering people to live healthier every single day. And, you know, giving people information and knowledge that allows them to make decisions that are best for themselves to move forward. And I feel like, for me, for nearly 18 years that I've been with the magazine, as you know, started as an intern, like you said, you know, that mission to help people resonates with me every single day still. Like I want to continue to do that and give back. And, you know, and, and you know, I know that this magazine and all the subsequent content that we produce for digital, it resonates um, not just with me, but with my team. And it's touching millions of lives with each issue and every month. And that gives me a sense of purpose. You know, it's, it's not just about me, it's about others and it's about doing good in this world. Oh yeah. Oh, speak into my heart that I love that Jamie. And, you know, I want to digress for just a moment. I thought it was interesting when we talked about the health practices, I mean, you didn't describe them as practices, but the things that you do to take care of your well being. You know, what I didn't hear was a lot of rigidity. What I heard was a lot of self-awareness and self-care. And so I just want to name that, you know, I want to, I mean, you know, I I want to to say that it can look a lot of different ways, just like, you know, know, what what looks, what health and well-being means to me is different to everyone else. What self-care means for me or for you means something different for everyone else. And it means something different in different seasons of our lives as well. So I just wanted to hear that, you know, and let you know that that was something that I really appreciate, um, to know that sometimes it's okay to let yourself sleep in. And that is what is going to make you the best person you need to be that day for whoever you need to show up for. Um, I do want to get your perspective as a journalist Mm -hmm. and also someone who is a leader in a health and wellness oriented organization, Lifetime, the larger organization, 
what do you observe, you know, in others, you know, maybe in your readers or in the members on a larger scale about this connection between purpose and well-being? You know, in the past few years, have been kind of bonkers. And yeah. I'm wondering what you see from your vantage point. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the finding a purpose in our meeting is really critical to pursuing health and well-being. And people come to lifetime, they pick up experience life because they're motivated to make some sort of healthy change in their life. But in one thing that, you know, I also co-host a podcast. My co-host is David Freeman. He's all about this idea of purpose-driven, you know, living a purpose-driven life as well. And we often talk about if you're not connected to that purpose or understand your why for getting there, if it's really more surface level, if it's that extrinsic motivation, like I want to look a certain way, I want the six pack abs, I want this, like often we fall off that wagon. Like if we're not connected to like my why is that I wanna be able to move functionally and keep up with my kids for as long as my life. I wanna expand not just my lifespan, but my health span and be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Then I, you know, have a different kind of motivation and why for showing up and pursuing health and well-being goals that that tend to be more sustainable. And I so th- I think that's the big thing. It's like those foundational habits. When people are able to set foundational habits around movement, nutrition, uh, sleep, stress management, building social connections, they often they're more sustainable. Like if we can, if we can create sustainable foundational habits that we can continue to come back to, and that occasionally we're going to fall away from, right? Like depending on where you are on any given day or week or month or year, you know, we can come back to them because at some point we've created the muscle memory, the neurological connections that we know that we can do this. And so I think it's, you know, what I have seen is that when we don't have that deeper why we start and we fall off we could try and start again, but then we get frustrated and continue to fall off. So a lot of people, it's kind of like, well, if I ate one cookie in the roll of Oreos, why not just eat all the cookies? You know, like we can, <laughs> we don't have to do that. So that's one thing, you know, it's like finding and creating sustainable foundational habits. I think that's when I've seen people make lasting change and stick with it. And they're overall over time, that health and well being continues to improve. Um, also it's, one thing is simplifying, you know, like if things are too complicated, if, if we're overcomplicating everything, then we get lost in the details and forget that kind of Northern star why for us. And then the other thing is when people don't find joy in what they're doing related to health and well-being, if they're feeling like they're being restricted, like they can't like restricted from something like they can't, right. it makes it all the more tempting to go back the other way. So how do we find joy and pleasure and satisfaction in what we do so that we can stick with it and stay with it? And it connects to a deeper part of us. So those are a few of the things, but then obviously there's COVID the last few years. I've also seen people like taking the time to really figure out what those things are, because we've had a moment in time where we need to pause and figure out what our next phase is. People are tired of being sick. They want to figure out how do I do this differently and in a way that actually works and is sustainable. It's interesting that you're saying the word sustainable, because uh-huh. in addition to making your health and wellness practices sustainable, um, you know, like I said, the, the other side of that is like, how, how do your health and wellness practices make you sustainable, right? Yes. And yes. Um, in what you're doing, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about burnout a little bit, because I think one of the things that's really true about people who are very purpose-driven in their life, especially in their work, is that they can become very identified with their with the thing that they wake up in the morning to do, right? That purpose can become all-consuming and they can throw everything at it and get burned out. And that's what I see a lot with my clients, right? I mean, like they're, you know, they're they're push, they're passion oriented, they're purpose-driven, and they're not taking care of themselves. And I guess one of the things I want to ask you in terms of self-care practices to tend to your physical, your emotional, your spiritual well-being, like what, when you are, you know, you're busy, you've got I mean, your, your, your signature line and your emails, like multiple, multiple li- lines long of all your different hats that you wear. When you feel yourself moving toward that state of burnout, or if you do like what, what practices do you fall back on so that you can sustain the work that you're doing? Right. Well, I mean, I think the thing that, you know, with burnout, it's true is like, we often feel disassociated from the work. Right. And like if that starts to happen and, you know, like I said, I've pretty much for the course of my career felt very connected to my work. There's been very few times I'm like, I don't want to go to work. This isn't working for me. Right. Mm -hmm. But 
I do, I would say that there were a couple of times in the probably a year or two, year and a half into the pandemic when I was like, this is too much. Like I'm not feeling connected to this. And at that point it was really like looking at what does this from a workload perspective look like? This is too much. What can I let go of? What can I delegate? You know, and you know, what do I need to let go of so that I can be re-inspired in other ways? You know, okay. and I think finding variety was good. What did so, you oh, yeah. yeah. No, so what did you do? Like what, like some of the things during that time? Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, it was delegating both at work and at home. You know, if I was overwhelmed and feeling a little numbed out, I was like, I have to hand things off. My kids are finally getting older. You know, I've been in that phase for a long time. It was like, my kids were really reliant on me for everything. And that can feel a little suffocating and feeling like overwhelmed. It's a little groundhog's day. Like, so now that they're getting older, it's being able to like hand some things off to my kids and let them take some things on and not have to be, you know, hovering with all those things. Like, from a burnout perspective at home um, and helping them understand why I need time for me. So for me, it's a lot about communicating my needs. Like I'm struggling right now. I'm having a really hard time feeling engaged. I'm, and I, I sought help, you know, I, I work with a therapist regularly and talk through that. I've, you know, talked with my team as well as with my leaders about when I've been struggling and what I need to do to make some changes. And hopefully, and I've been able to make shifts in order to kind of get re-inspired and to, to do things a little bit differently, even though the core of my job is the same core of my role is the same. I've been able to make little shifts that have been pretty exciting. Like one of those is the podcast. It's another way of talking about and sharing this information, um, especially in the last couple of years in a new way. And that's been really fun to be able to share it. Like you're doing here. This is a fun and exciting way. Like I'm, I'm so in the print words all the time that it's kind of nice to like talk about it and have a conversation. And that's really re-excited me about this content and just helping people in different ways. You know, and make sure, and I'll put this in the, um, in the follow-up notes as well, but the name of your podcast. Yeah. It's lifetime talks. Lifetime talks. Yep. And it's, it's an interesting podcast. I mean, a lot of experts in the organization, but it, you know, yep. with the steady, the steady helm of Jamie and, and, um, oh gosh, David, David. David. yeah, he's yeah. great. Yeah. He's great. Um, before we move to the second part of our conversation, I really want to hear what people think about what you've been saying, what we've been talking about, but I do want to give you the opportunity to talk about one of your primary or one of your big passion purpose projects, which is the, the work on the legislation for oh. newborn testing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And I will say I'm not doing as much right now as I wish I was doing, you know, it's something that it's like a steady drum beat in my life. But so back in 2013, my nephew, who was at the time six months old, was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder called Crab A disease. And it's, you know, a autosomal recessive condition. It means that both this was my sister-in-law son, my sister and my sister and her husband both carry the same mutation that resulted in this condition. And it, in many ways, it's almost like um, ALS in children. My nephew, he, we thought he was fine um, and he wasn't, you know, at six months old, he started regressing instead of developing. And it was really interesting because just to digress for a second, my youngest is a month, was a month younger than him at the time. And so I was seeing my daughter make these amazing strides. And then I was like, I remember holding my nephew once and being like, oh my gosh, his head is really weak. That's really strange. And seeing this. So we didn't know at birth that he had this, it came out in symptoms. And once symptoms start, there's really nothing you can do. There's no cure. Um, so he passed away, um, at 18 months. So about a year after he was diagnosed and it was at that time that we you know we were like, there's, there's gotta be some way to like help other families not have to go through this pain. And so I started getting more involved with, um, the newborn screening committee here in Minnesota to try and advocate, to get crab a along with other, um, leukodystrophies is the category it falls under to be part of the newborn screening process. And there are very few states around the U.S. that actually have Crab A included. There are more that are coming um, and are working towards that. But it's really about raising awareness because, you know, there are some treatments that are it's not super effective, but it's still it's like if you can help a family identify proactively that this is happening, if you can find out at birth, there are things you can do. And so helping people just raising awareness. And I think going back to our talk about purpose, one thing also that S Emily S. Fahani Smith talks about is how adversity helps us find our purpose and adversity going through hard things. It reconnects us with our why in many ways, like the stuff that seems like a big deal sometimes on a daily basis kind of falls to the wayside. I know like I reconnected with like, this is what I have to do and why I do it. 
especially during that year when we were kind of in the midst, I was my sister's support and it was kind of that I wasn't the first ring, you know, like you think about it, they were in the bullseye with that diagnosis. I was on that outer ring and I was there to help, but it's like, it, it just gave me perspective and made me reconnect with my why. So like, that's why family for me is first and foremost, a value connecting and staying connected with them. And obviously health and well-being, you know, in his case, he couldn't control what happened to him. It was a genetic disorder. There was nothing we could do, but there are so many things that I can do to take care of my own health and well-being, to live a healthy, happy, long life, hopefully, and that I can share with others through the research and the experts and all this information we have at Experience Life. And so it's, you know, I was already deeply connected with the work I was doing. Health and wellness was part of me, but when that happened, it was like, I was even more deeply passionate about getting like, how do we help people be more proactive about their health without shaming people without, we want to empower people. It's not about shaming them, but like, let's do it in a way that actually will make a difference and that they can, there's one thing they can do better tomorrow than today, you know, and it's all like, that's what my mission is with this magazine and with everything that we write in those pages and any article we put out. So it all Thank comes you. full circle in many it ways. Comes with that. <laughs> There's that talent of closing out the story. Nice job. Yeah. Jamie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for thank you for what you do. Thank you for sharing your your story about what purpose is in, in your life and in your work and in your family. I really appreciate that. And I'm really glad that you're here.